Thank you guys. It's 8.30 a.m. so I'm surprised that everyone turned up because <laughs> I probably wouldn't. I'd probably stay in bed. Um, and so today I've committed to being vulnerable and I'm going to be really honest about my feelings leading up to this talk. Anxious, scared, <laughs> worried and stressed, thinking why on earth did I decide to do this? Why on earth do I constantly put myself in situations that makes me feel extremely anxious. And every time I doubt myself, I am reminded of a conversation that I had with a senior designer. It was the year that I had graduated from my bachelor's, a time that I had just came back from Adobe Max in LA, flown to Queensland to receive a design award. I finished my program at CD and Co. It's a studio in Australia and it's one of my favourite design studios. The work is amazing and the people are incredible. And received an offer to work at Deloitte Digital the year after. That's the view from the office. I thought I should put it in. It's the Opera House. A time where I could finally see myself as a product designer and was accepted to study my masters abroad. I felt like I was living a life beyond my dreams and every single opportunity that I had received that year was something that I couldn't believe that I could even achieve from the beginning. And so what this designer had said to me was honest and sincere but hard to hear because he knew that behind all these achievements was an exhausted, scared and insecure girl. He knew that if I decided to move abroad, my five pillars of support would, put, would be put into ultimate test. The unsettling relationship with my family, the ending of a long-term relationship, the confusion behind my faith, the isolation from friends, and the loss in my identity. By moving abroad, he believed that these five pillars will become, only become more blurred and worse yet, that I was about to hit a burnout. A burnout. A creative worst nightmare, but really everybody's worst nightmare. And so today, his words act as a reminder that authentic freedom lies in braving the ambiguity. Because Instead of hiding behind my anxiety, I asked myself, what do I want to do with it? Because I do know my anxiety comes from a sense of care. I care about all of you and all your precious time. And being avoidant isn't going to help. Cataloging all the things that could go wrong and let fear loom over me isn't going to help. In fact, if I want to be brave, I will have to triumph over these fears and it's better to do it sooner rather than later. Because when we are braving, fear will make itself known. And so the evening after my conversation with him, I bought my ticket to the UK. And though I was really excited to start studying my masters in digital experience design, I was more excited I was about to leave Australia. Indefinitely. And was curious about the world outside. I was so done with being Sydney and thought to myself, anywhere but here. And so who would have known that less than a week in Manchester on a rainy, cold, gloomy day, I was sitting in Predator Major on 34 Oxford Street, wanting to end it all. I felt ashamed, stupid and hopeless. And in that moment, all I could think of was how can I vanish? How can I disappear from this world for good? Because he was right. I was scared, I was exhausted, and I came this close to dropping out of school, planning to run away from everyone and everything I knew. And the only reason why I didn't was thanks to a teacher and a few people I knew in my life. Because it was then that I realised that no matter how far I ran, 
my fears and insecurities will follow me until I turn to face them. One of those triggers were reading and writing. For most of my childhood, I was constantly being, re being reminded of my terrible English. Teachers, family and friends would mock me of the way I wrote and spoke. I failed my first and last research paper and swore to myself then that I would never ever write again and would do everything it takes to avoid it. And so when I was told in the first week of college that I'll be submitting a research paper every month, have a client presentation every month, and submit a final thesis, 16,000 word thesis paper, yeah, I had a mental breakdown. <laughs> in the moment, I knew I was setting myself up for failure. The success rate was negative zero. There was no need to average out from past experiences because I knew in that moment that the outcome will be the same. And with this much certainty, fear had rightfully engulfed me. It wasn't a what if, it was a this will happen. And maybe because the feeling of shame to fly back home outweighed my commitment to stay, I actually ended up choosing to give it a go. Standing here today, I can proudly say that I've graduated with a distinction and wrote my thesis on designing for emotional resilience. <laughs> my master's journey became my final thesis. And my master's journey became my final thesis. And what built me up to this nightmarish paper that felt like a ticking time bomb was that after every submission, my confidence in writing grew stronger and fonder. And though I don't write research papers anymore, thank gosh, because I'm totally out of practice, so no thank you. <laughs> but I did fall in love with reading and decided to continue conquering my fear in public speaking. So I chose to share this story for two reasons. One, even if we are sure of an outcome because of our past experiences, the narrative can still change. You can fail 99% of the time, but all you need is that 1% to start pushing the scale back the other way. Two, even though we can feel certain about a decision or an outcome, what comes after will always remain a mystery. We simply cannot know what has not happened yet. So no matter how certain we feel, the future will always remain uncertain. And when we are certain, we become vulnerable. And when we are vulnerable, everything becomes difficult, difficult to distinguish between the real and the fake. Everything feels out of control. A great example is the emotion anger. During my research, I came across many participants who said something along the lines of, when I'm angry, I lose control and there's nothing I can do about it. And I'm sure many of us in this room have felt this way before, when we are in a heated argument and we start to say things that we don't mean. And that behaviour is called emotional regulation. And we all regulate our emotions differently. Some would walk away to refrain from starting a fight. And others may break down in tears. This is because our emotional experiences are not erratic and unconscious, but are goal-directed. They're heavily influenced by our cultural upbringing and past experiences. Hence, similar situations will often trigger similar emotions, like, the fe like lo losing control when angry and my fear in writing. The good news here is that these emotional patterns aren't fixated. We can build a flexibility by cultivating in new experiences and taking a reflective, a reflective approach. So for my thesis paper, I sent out a survey to 89 participants between the age of 22 and 53 years old. Unsurprisingly, 97% reported to, be, to ex experience an, a degree of emotional confusion and, insta and instability, and 89% saw themselves as deep reflective thinkers. This combination of emotional confusion and deep reflective thinking can often cause uncomfortable emotions to remain within our lives and accumulate over a long period of time.
leading to not just anxiety, but overthinking. Let's take the analogy of taking the trash out. Imagine all the emotions that you feel in a day are individual trash items scattered around your place. Your place is so messy that you don't even know where to begin cleaning. And instead of working through the rubbish, you choose to push it aside and ignore it, hoping that it will disappear over time. What actually happens is that over time, it piles up so high that it makes it hard to ignore and worse yet, makes the job to be done much more difficult. So just like maintaining our home and taking the trash out, we must attend to our emotional baggages every day. But how do we become emotionally confused yet reflective thinkers? Well, for many of us, discussions around uncomfortable emotions were non-existent. In fact, certain emotions weren't welcome at home like anger. Anger was seen as a socially unacceptable emotion that's when we first experienced it in childhood, we were never taught how to handle them. But what we would know now is that if we don't express it, we oppress it, pushing it aside and ignoring the trash. This means by sweeping a child's experience under the rug, they can develop strategies to escape aversive situations rather than facing them, which paradoxically tends to heighten those uncomfortable emotions. As for me, if I was to run away from my fears, I would loathe over shame and hopelessness, thinking that I did not have a choice and that the way it is, is the way it will be. And that's how I saw my life before 23. A time where I let fear choose for me. I let the bullies bully me. I let the words of others fool me. I let their judgment determine my strengths and weaknesses and have it all convince me that I'm not good enough, that I don't deserve to be here, that I am useless and worthless, that I am powerless in my own life, that I did not have a choice, that this was my destiny. The limitations bounded by the perception of someone else's definition of me held me back from creating my own authentic life. I let the voices of others dominate my true personality my identity, my passion and dreams, because I convinced myself that everybody else knew me better than I knew myself. I even let the fear of trying become red signals to stop and gave up on choosing and pursuing and simply let life happen to me. What I wish I knew then was that when we give up on choice, we lack the courage to live authentically. Because by not deciding, we have still made a choice. We made a choice to let others decide for us. We made a choice to give up our own agency. And thus we lose the moment and lose the ability to truly understand ourselves. We let everyone, including ourselves, dump their trash into our garden and into our space. And so for me, choice is power. I may not have control over the world around me, but I have the power to choose how I want to respond and act. I may be uncertain and afraid of the future, but I have the power to choose how I want to respond and act. I most likely will make mistakes, and most definitely will actually, and do the wrong thing, but I have the power to choose how I want to respond and act. It is only when we start to actively engage with our own lives do we become the creator of it? Do we stay open and truthful to an authentic new beginning? And I'm probably going to butcher her name, but I really love the passage by Simone de Var. She says, every refusal is a choice. Every silence has a voice. Our very passivity is willed. In order to not choose, we still must choose not to choose. It's impossible to escape. Being disengaged is inauthentic because we are responsible for our actions and non-actions alike. In doing nothing, we lose ourselves. And so remember at the beginning of the talk how I mentioned to you about the designer who had the conversation where he warned me of what's to come if I did decide to move abroad. 
and it was mostly around mental instability and um, the five pillars of support. Well, he wasn't wrong entirely because what came after was far greater than I could have ever dreamed of, honestly. Because to begin with, we were faced with a pandemic, right? <laughs> I had, I moved to the UK and had, without securing an apartment and had less than a week to find one. I know, smart move. <laughs> walking around with my suitcase thinking, what, the, what on earth am I going to do here? I felt extremely sick and was diagnosed with an illness. My legs started to grow some weird white fungi because of the lack of movement. I then had three days to decide where I want to move to next before my UK visa expired. One month in Berlin, there was a six month lockdown in what felt like the longest winter especially coming from Australia. <laughs> I had no friends. My job was remote. The hours were late. And I spent my ent the entire lockdown alone, afraid, uncertain and hopeless. Thinking to myself at one point, this must be what solitary confinement might feel like. I was scammed 3,000 euros and struggled my way through the bureaucracy in Berlin and spent more weekends at home crying to myself than I had ever before. And that wasn't all it. Because I'd still had to face those five pillars, family, friends, relationship, identity, and faith. I felt as if I was trying to give closure to my past whilst being attacked by my present and worried about my future. And all I wanted in those moments was for time to stand still, just so that I could catch a breath of fresh air and restart my engine. And I hope that all of us have felt this way at some point in our life where it's all too much and the world is so chaotic and so confusing that we just need a break from it all. Well, good news is that during my research, I found from all the participants I've spoken to that when they were faced with a challenging situation, they each subconsciously found an activity that could take them into a state of flow. A feeling where time halts because you are enjoying what you do so much so that time simply passes by. Abraham Maslow, the creator of Hierarchy of Needs, calls it the plateau experience. And I think each of us may know one or two of these activities, like exercising and meditation. But I hope we also know that, like many things, it's just not for everyone, or perhaps not enough for everyone. And that's okay because it's not about completing those tasks that matter, but instead finding activities that can transcend everyday frustrations and conf conflicts. Why? Because imagine waking up every day facing a new challenge when we are already emotionally exhausted and struggling to find our way through some of the most difficult experience, like rage, fear, despair and hopelessness. It's near impossible because we are constantly returning into an unfulfilling job or remaining in an unhealthy relationship or worse yet, living in a home full of trash. And even if we see the problem and fix the tangible situation, our body still requires a replenishment of resources. And we, have, we all have different ways of achieving this. For some, it was cooking. And for others, it was dancing. Often, it was creative, and for me, it was drawing. It was turning my reflections into visual creations. Because in the short term, by doing these meaningful tasks, it can help us process our difficult emotions rather than letting those emotional baggages grow and overwhelm us. And in the long term, if we start doing it every day, we start to invest in what Michael Matters calls our resilience bank account, whereby the combination of activities act as a reservation 
for when we are facing a challenging situation and provide the flexibility to accept a situation rather than act in defence. Because that often would lead to emotional avoidance and a skewed perception of the world. And so what I hope that we all take from this talk is that when we don't attend to our emotions, we can be easily influenced by the existing infra infrastructures and social norms. We settle in comfort inside an echo chamber without putting in the effort of truly understanding ourselves. We choose to conform rather than rebel, letting the ambiguous world determine the consequences of us being afraid. When in fact, we all have the resources within us. We just must learn to see its potential. And when we all understand that, I hope we remember that in life, to never forget that authentic freedom is, lies in braving the ambiguity. And when we remember that, we must know in life, you can't always trust the outside world, other people, or even your own body. But when all else fails, you can still count on your mental resources. And that's where resilience comes in. Thank you. <laughs>